data URLs. Well, afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming out uh, to my talk today. Um, so before we get started, let's, uh, let's just kick off a little, little quiz here called uh, um, Know Your IPs. All right, just shout it out if somebody knows. All right, cool. All right, this one should be pretty easy. All right. Yeah, IPv6. Ooh, this, one's, this one might be a little tougher. Here's a little clue. This is how you get into the matrix. All right, lastly, star of today's show. That's why you guys are here, right? I'm going to learn about uh, cloud metadata URLs and I'm um, going to cover some basic use cases for them like legitimately and then how you can um, abuse them. So kind of the inspiration for this talk came from this t-shirt that um, I've seen, uh, seen different people wear over the years for uh, different cons and stuff. It says, uh, you know, there's no place like 127.0.0.1. And uh, it's pretty common that most IT professionals know this, this IP address. So um, I'm like, well, you know, a lot of stuff is going to this thing called the cloud and uh, a lot of workloads and apps and stuff. And uh, a lot of system um, admins and whatnot are, are going to be... be uh, going to have to become affiliated with uh, the 169.254.169.254 IP address. So I was just like, well, we'll just uh, we'll throw that one in there. So the, the whole point of this talk is to kind of raise some uh, awareness around that IP. So a little bit about me. During the day, daytime, I work at Rackspace on our threat and vulnerability um, an analyst team. And uh, we do both, mostly vulnerability management, pen testing, a little red teaming here and there. Uh, my colleague, uh, Rodney, he's going to be doing a talk right after mine about some of the cool um, attacks that we see at Rackspace and uh, some of the cool um, bugs and stuff that he's found within our own infrastructure. Um, in terms of certs, I, I have my OSCP, and uh, recently I got my AWS Certified Solutions Architect. Um, if I had to draw an analogy, this would be kind of like your certified ethical hacker for like the cloud stuff. It's a, a very broad... Um, cert that covers a lot of different technologies, doesn't go very deep, um, but it's um, AWS specific. And I'll talk a little bit later like why I decided to do that. Um, I'm probably the world's most mediocre bug bounty um, person for Cynac. Uh, last year, um, in partnership with Rackspace, uh, we open sourced a distributed MMAP scanner called Scantron. Um, that I, I gave a talk at B-Sides Austin this year. Um, you can follow me on Twitter or GitHub there. And um, lastly, I, I wrote a book called The Cyber Plumber's Handbook. And this is uh, basically the definitive guide to SSH tunneling, port redirection, and bending traffic like a boss. So this book is um, always free for students, um, as long as you have an educational um, email. Um, but as a token of my appreciation for you guys coming out today, I'm giving away free copies as well. Um, so I'll, I'll keep that up there for a couple minutes if you want to, or a couple seconds if you want to take a, a screenshot of it. And then um, I'll have it at the end too. And you can always just hit me up if uh, you forgot it or didn't write it down anywhere. See a couple more cameras up. All right, last one. Cool. So where was the, uh, kind of where did the inspiration for this talk come from? Um, it was kind of last summer. So um, at Rackspace, we have a lot of developers and uh, system owners who work with a lot of bleeding edge technology, whether it's uh, in the different cloud environments or uh, with containers and Kubernetes and all this stuff. And um, as a security team, we tend to be kind of chasing after the car, like, hey, wait, 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 you gotta, you need brakes in the car, or you need this type of security and stuff like that. And a lot of the system owners we were talking to were, um, you know, kind of not talking over our head, but like dropping a lot of acronyms and um, words and phrases like, I, you know, I just, I don't know what, what they're talking about. I need to, I need to figure out and uh, learn this cloud thing. And the second component was a, a hacker one report that I, I came across last um, summer as well. I don't remember how it came um, onto my radar, but uh, somebody was basically able to uh, query a bunch of metadata um, in an AWS instance um, through a reverse proxy. 
And at first I was like, oh, cool. I, I didn't even know you could, you could do that with um, curl to like to um, go through like a, a, a reverse proxy. So to let, um, kind of level set on some of the defi definitions here. Um, so you're all probably familiar with a traditional uh, HTTP or web, web based pro uh, proxy. Um, so you're sitting in your corporate environment, you want to get to a website, um, you know, your company forces you to go through some sort of appliance or, or proxy in order to prevent you from browsing um, to bad, known bad sites or whatever. Um, just think of it uh, with reverse, it's just the opposite. So it's traffic that's coming into um, a corporate environment. So metadata is basically just data about data. URL, you should all be pretty pretty familiar with this. Um, uniform resource, resource locator. And when we combine these, metadata URL, it's basically a URL that allows you to query and retrieve data from a cloud server. So there's a lot of legitimate uses for uh, metadata URLs. Uh, it's mostly with configuration or management. Um, you can also query it to get instance information. Um, I'll show you in a little bit here. Uh, like your IP address, your public IP address, MAC address, a um, lot, of, lot of different um, juicy information you can get out of that. Um, also, when it comes to scripting, um, with uh, I'll show an example with like uh, in Python, um, you kind of want to, you need, might need to know what availability, <coughs> availability zone you are in, um, so you can query the, the metadata and pull that metadata and pull that out for your script. So it's somewhat agnostic where you don't have to really care um, where the, the script is smart enough to kind of know where it is in life. So Amazon describes their metadata service as data about your instance. So if you're familiar with their EC2 instances, their Elastic Cloud Compute, uh, it's basically like a, a virtual private server or you know your traditional just um, server in the cloud. Um, they also have something called user data where you can plug in and specify data and commands that um, are executed at, at boot time. So if you want to run like apt update or apt upgrade, um, that's somewhere where you can uh, put that information as well. So here's an example of uh, using curl um, if you're actually on the instance itself um, in AWS. And what happens is it returns a string object. And it's not something pretty and formatted like uh, in JSON that's a lot easier to use programmatically. Um, and when you look at it, it's kind of like a pseudo file folder structure. So anything that doesn't end in a slash, you can query it and get information in that. But if there's a slash, it means it's, it's a, there's folders or information under that as well. So here's an example using the Boto3 Python library. Um, and in this case, we're trying to determine the, uh, the region that we're actually in because we need to pass it to um, create a, a, a simple queue service object. So we use Python's request to uh, query the availability zone, um, do a little uh, data manipulation on that, and then just pass it to the, uh, um, the SQS object there. So this script can live in any different availability zone. We don't have to worry about it. Um, breaking or hard coding like, you know, US East 1 or something like that. So with um, Microsoft Azure, there's a slightly different, the, the endpoint is a little bit different, um, and you also have to include a, a header and API version date. Um, however, they do return a JSON object, so go Microsoft. Uh, DigitalOcean, so this is their endpoint, again, slightly uh, different. They do provide an option to um, uh, return a JSON object. And one of the nice things is they actually include the user data in that same endpoint. Uh, with AWS, you have to query two different endpoints. So here's an example um, in this is DigitalOcean. So you can see here we have like the ID, host name, uh, there's the included user data and the region. And here's just uh, re retrieving the, the JSON endpoint on that and piping it to a, a cool little utility called JQ. So anytime you need to kind of prettyfy or clean up JSON, uh, JSON, uh, JSON output, you can just pipe it to that. 
All right, so now that we, we're kind of familiar with how we're supposed to be using these metadata URLs, um, let's take a look at some of the ways that we, we could abuse them. So about maybe six, seven, eight weeks ago, um, a gentleman uh, that works for this company called Summit Route released a, a pretty nice little white paper that focused on AWS security and just uh, basically common best practices in order to harden your environment. And uh, so you take a look at that and, you know, the first one there is the um, publicly accessible S3 buckets and Elasticsearch clusters um, like the, the talk uh, talked about earlier um, today. Um, leaked access keys, you know, if somebody actually dumps somebody, <coughs> includes them in GitHub or something, you could take that and, you know, obviously do something malicious with it. Um, but lastly, this one was uh, compromised IAM roles. So these are identity and access management roles uh, through SSRF, which is server-side request forgery, or RCE, remote code execution against an EC2, Elastic Cloud Compute. Um, resulting in access to the metadata service at the IP that we obviously care about today. Um, so I'll just mention a little bit about server-side request forgery so you're, you're uh, kind of familiar with it. Um, basically, it's when you uh, re ha take advantage of a web app that is supposed to go retrieve data from some other URL or something and you, you use it to query like itself or um, query stuff that it wasn't really designed or meant to do. Um, there's a cool little GitHub uh, project out there if you want to play around with that and also like a tool to kind of do the, the SSRF mapping stuff, but um, that's the, the most I'm going to be talking about that today. So going back to the kind of the inspiration for this talk, um, taking a look at the, uh, the bug, bug report for this, so this uh, person was using curl to pull the metadata URL and they were specifying a reverse proxy with the TACX there, and then including this 25603 uh, port, which isn't really a, a common, well-known port. So I saw that and I was like, well, you know what? Like, you know, how many, re how many like re legit reverse proxies are misconfigured to allow communication with the the 169 IP? So this was, you know, taking going after ports that are a little bit more well-known. Uh, to be reverse proxies, or at least proxy ports in general. So the first step was collecting data. So um, part of this was uh, I created a, just wrote a little Python script. Um, I'll, I'll have the link to that at the end. Um, but the point of this was to go out and actually pull those um, I, IP blocks from the various service providers. So Amazon is pretty nice and generous. They just give it to you in a, a JSON object so you can um, parse and slice and dice, get whatever information you want. Uh, with Azure, it's the same thing. They, they uh, publish those, so it's all public. And then lastly, DigitalOcean. They don't provide these publicly. Um, I had to do a little copy pasty and then command line foo. Um, from a, an ipinfo.io site right there to get those out. So the next step was to do um, some scanning for the, the top proxy ports. And the tool I used to decide, uh, the tool I decided to use for that was mask scan, um, just specifying the ports there. Uh, one of the neat little things is you can, a little pro tip here is you can specify the user agent. So if you're you're scanning perhaps a website or something, and you don't specify that, it's gonna have um, basically mass scan in the user agent and a lot of uh, defensive um, appliances and tools will see that and, and block it as malicious. So a uh, little pro tip there if you're, you're trying to avoid that. Um, so then we're also scanning all those different IP ranges and then outputting it in a JSON format. And with Amazon, I think it, it took about three hours or so, so it wasn't wasn't too bad against all their whole IP block. So once I had that JSON file with all the open all the open ports and or IP IP or basically open ports, um, I used a, another tool that I wrote for the the Scantron project to convert um, it 
those results and just to an IP port pair to make it a little bit easier. So I had a, some IP responded on one of those uh, five proxy ports. So the cloud metadata extractor Python script I wrote, it collects IPs. You can test for vulnerable reverse proxies. It dumps all the data. It provides uh, just some nice pastables if you're trying to do some post exploitation. And then lastly, logs all the results for you. You have to go back and you know take a look at it again. And I'll have a link for this at the, the end. Some of the features, it's, all, it's asynchronous, it's really fast. Um, again, probably took a, maybe two, three hours on average for um, each of the, the different providers. Uh, re retrieves header information, and as well as does like a re reverse DNS lookup. And with the header information, that was to try and glean some, uh, get some hints as to actually who owns these IPs, because a large majority of them, like I, it was hard to um, attribute it to anybody that um, actually owned it. It was just, you know, it's just an IP out there. You can't tell who actually owns it. Um, and with the reverse DNS lookups, that was to take, uh, trying to um, determine the domain that's actually associated with an IP. Um, even though I did this, I don't think any of them actually had those records, and so that was kind of a, a lost cause. But in the event that one did pop up, it, it would provide that for you. So one of the cool little functions I got to write um, was to pull all the AWS data recursively. So if you remember, it just returns this kind of old school string object and there's this pseudo file folder structure and it's really hard to um, you know, like go through and like pull out the exact data you want. So I uh, wrote a little function, you just basically feed it a base path and then it just, just goes and keeps, and pull, uh, keeps pulling all that information and returns a nice um, JSON dictionary for you. So here's uh, running that script in action, um, just specifying the provider there. So in this case, it's AWS, uh, giving it the IP port pairs that we, we have. Um, so one thing um, I didn't really mention, there's another endpoint uh, where you can pull out dynamic data with, uh, with an AWS. Um, I coded that in, it w there wasn't really a lot of interesting stuff in it, um, but I didn't know it at the time, so I was just pulling it. Um, it also, you can give it the option to pull the metadata or, and or the user data as well, since those are uh, two separate endpoints. Uh, with Azure, it was a little bit more straightforward, just changing up the, um, the provider. Uh, DigitalOcean, you know, same thing. So, is the internet on fire? Uh, I'd say no, maybe, meh. Um, so taking a look at this, reading this, so they're uh, on the AWS line, there are about 291,000 boxes that came back with one of those top, or with one of those ports open. And of those, 803 were vulnerable to um, being able to access that, that metadata URL through uh, the reverse proxy. Um, and lastly, this isn't really adjusted or normalized for the IP space, so you might look like, oh, Amazon, that's, you know, they're the worst out of these, but you know, if they have, for example, like 5% of the IP space, then it's really not that bad. So um, it just, the, the, the numbers aren't anal uh, normalized for that one. So in terms of service breakdown, I know this is kind of a, an eye chart here. Um, it was just across the board with like different um, tools and, and, and services. There was Apache in there, uh, Golang, Jetty, some PHP stuff. Uh, I think a, the big majority um, one was a lot of squid proxies. Um, Tornado, it's like a Python uh, web framework. Nginx, and then lastly, Tiny Proxy. So most of the vulnerable proxies didn't really have a whole lot of juicy information. I was able to query like the, the metadata URL on it, but um, there just really wasn't a lot there. Um, but you better buckle your seatbelts because there was some, uh, some of them did have some interesting stuff. So first up, uh, sens some sensitive data. Uh, there were some Salesforce passwords. Uh, there was a Bitbucket um, repo in there. They had a username and password for a, the Spring framework, which I think is a um, something Java. 
um, in the host name, it actually had a, a domain, so that would help with attribution and like figuring out who actually owns this. The security group itself was um, basically a DNS domain. Uh, there was a lot of user data that had passwords, so in this case, um, when this box fires up, they just echoed in a, a, a password and, and changed it to root. Um, and this is this is not good because you know if they weren't using SSH keys or something like then you have that that root uh, username and password and you could you know potentially SSH in with that. Uh, this was an application called Airlock. I wasn't too familiar with it. Uh, this one had a zip password, username, um, and password as well. And then there was some random stuff. So. If anybody recognizes this stuff, just shout it out. I'm kind of curious. Um, the first one was this Eddie J. Hole script. Um, no idea what this was. I, th I think I found something last night. It's, it was like a Facebook Messenger PHP plugin or, or WordPress plugin or something like that. Um, but that one was mostly across the, the AWS instances that were scanned. Uh, ADM Manager saw this across all the providers. Dark side black, saw that across providers too. And park side load balancers, I could not figure out what that was, if it was a company or what. Uh, but that one was mostly in, only in AWS as well. And then a lot of the, the AWS ones had, in their user data, this thing called 3Proxy. It was a, it's a, basically, a, it's a proxy um, that you can go and play with. Um, and I couldn't figure out why they all had the same um, configuration setup um, or script, basically. Um, like trying to fi figure out if it was like pulled from a repo or something, or maybe, um, I mean, they might have all been the same one. But that was kind of kind of one of the challenges is like trying to figure out, you know, what systems might have been grouped together in the same ones, or if they were just, you know, truly disparate ones. So for this research, this is kind of where I, I stopped. I, I just kind of collected data, figured out which boxes were actually vulnerable to this. I didn't do any further enumeration or exploitation of this. Um, however, if you have the authority to do it, um, there's a lot of kind of different attack vectors you can do with this um, in order to kind of land and expand into their environment. Um, so we saw earlier with the root password, um, and one of them there was private SSH keys, um, so I could have tried using that on the actual box itself, or um, in their install script they were, I think it was actually to their GitHub repo too um, as well. Um, there's a lot of third party application type stuff here, so we saw the Salesforce, um, ServiceNow type stuff that you could you know, test and hypothetically um, move around and uh, within their different networks. So when it comes to privilege escalation and pivoting, um, with DigitalOcean and Azure, the, the user data was mostly where you were going to be able to find that, that good stuff. They don't, um, they don't have uh, a lot of the IM role type stuff that we're going to see in the next slide with, with AWS. So if they did have user data in, the, in those ones, that's where, you know, that's where some of the juicy stuff would have been. Um, with Amazon, it's a little bit different. So we were pulling stuff, for, I was able to pull stuff from the user data and um, uh, do basically um, identity access management role abuse. So an example would be, um, so if you spun up like an EC2 box uh, with Amazon, you can assign it uh, different roles and privileges. Um, so you could say like this box is only able to write to S3 buckets and maybe read from a, a queue. Um, you know, it's like kind of the analogy is you don't want your secretary running as domain admin. Um, so if, you, if you're familiar with uh, pr uh, least concept of least privilege, um, it's kind of the same thing. So within AWS, you can dump the access key ID, the secret access key, and the token. And when I say dump, I make it sound like it's somewhat hard, but they literally just give it to you. Um, so you can use those to... Uh, as part of another analogy, think of like passing the hash. So you can use those credentials to perhaps spin up new infrastructure or execute commands or, you know, the, there's kind of a, a wide variety of uh, attack surface that's exposed because of that. 
And, and it's mostly because of these overprivileged roles. So taking a look at this, these were some of the role names. Um, so when you sign up for AWS, like you, you basically get like a, a root, root level one and they tell you, you know, don't really use this, uh, create a different one. Um, so looking at some of these, if you saw like uh, admin role or, you know, root or something like that, uh, with those with those credentials, if they were privileged enough, you could spin up your own infrastructure. You could um, do a whole bunch of different stuff. That um, there's actually a couple exploitation frameworks out there for that. Uh, the first one is Nimbo Stratus. This one it's like five or six years old, but I think it was one of the first ones out there. I, I haven't played with it too much, um, but it you basically feed it those. Um, This, the access key, secret access key, and token, and then you can uh, kind of determine what you're able to see with that. The next one is uh, Paku. It's from the, the folks at Rhino Security. Um, this is probably like the metasploit of uh, AWS exploitation. So there's a, it's a whole framework around that. It's very modular. Um, you can, again, do like recon. You can determine what level of access the, um, you have. Um, they have uh, just a, a couple different um, pretty cool modules with that. I, I just started playing with that, so I can't talk too much to it, though. So lastly, responsible dis disclosure. Um, so this was going through manually a little bit, doing some grep food, trying to figure out, you know, of these boxes that were vulnerable, who actually owned them so I could, you know, let them know that, hey, you might want to get this is fixed. So looking for domains or any clues as to who the IP owner might be. Um, I did manage to determine a few of them, reached out through LinkedIn, Twitter, email, um, and also through company contact pages. And um, anybody that's ever done any kind of responsible disclosure, it can be uh, kind of frustrating sometimes because you're like, oh, you got this big problem, you should get this fixed. And that's just like radio silence. Um, so still have a couple uh, Cases open with a, a few of these uh, companies as well, um, but for the most part, it was really hard to determine who who actually owned them, um, just based off either the user data or the metadata that was returned. You know, if I if I'd taken those AWS creds and started trying to enumerate more of the the account, I might have been able to figure out something, but I didn't. So when it comes to defensive countermeasures, uh, first of all, just know that these exist. If you're setting up any kind of infrastructure um, in the cloud, just know that they exist, that you can leverage them for good, but also that um, if, if you don't know necessarily what you're doing or your application isn't um, configured correctly, that they can be abused. Um, again, practice least privilege um, for assigning roles to different AWS instances and services. If you are running a reverse proxy, make sure that uh, there's no un unauthenticated access to any of the, maybe even local host, um, but in addition to the 169 IP. Um, there's also, you can uh, enable a host-based firewall. Um, in this case here, um, they're denying traffic to that IP unless you're root. So, you know, you shouldn't obviously run like a web app as root. Um, so some of the future work. Um, probably expanding the ports a little bit, looking at, you know, TCP 80, 443, sometimes those could be used for a reverse proxy. Um, there's a couple other cloud platforms out there as well. Uh, Google Cloud Platform, um, they have like an internal DNS that you can query there. There's Alibaba Cloud, um, they want to be a little bit different and have a, a different IP, uh, metadata URL IP there. Um, looking at maybe integrating some of this with uh, within the, the, the Paku framework that I just mentioned. Um, and also IP filtering bypass. So um, you may you may configure your application to say like, whoa, yeah, I want to block the 169.254, um, what's called you know the dotted dotted quad IP address. Um, but you, you may not block like the octal IP or the hexadecimal IP or the integer IP, um, which are all valid. Like if you if you did a, like a ping of yahoo.com, took that IP address and then put it in here and uh, grabbed a, the integer IP and did HTTP colon slash slash that integer IP, that will resolve to, to Yahoo. So uh, just kind of an interesting little 
uh, tidbit there. So lastly, um, I just uh, released the, the code. I actually need to make the repo public, so it's probably not accessible right now. Um, but it is, slight, it is slightly neutered right now in terms of the actually pulling the data from these um, uh, different cloud providers because I'm still working with um, on some of the responsible disclosure stuff. But once that um, kind of expires in terms of, yes, I gave you them enough time to, to you know, fix this, um, I'll make that publicly available. So that's it. Um, if there's any questions, there's my email. Um, on Twitter, also there's the uh, the voucher code again. If you're looking to pick up uh, the Cyber Plumbers Handbook, um, and without further ado, that's it. Um, are there any questions? Going once, twice, sold. All right, thank you.